Hello, this is Joe Neville and welcome to Getting Started with Python for Network Engineer Types. Now this is a recording of a presentation that I've given a few times. I thought I would create a YouTube video out of it for posterity, clicks and likes, etc. Now I know that it is a long video and it's more discussion about why you should start learning Python. Maybe not just for your role today but this is very much about where networks going and preparing for your future. If you're looking for the more practical how to get started information that is towards the end. So what I've done is in the description I have put some timestamps so you can jump ahead to learn my view on what you should be learning with Python, how to get started with a kind of more, more practical approach and uh, my link to a reading list. But for now, let's get on with the show. OK, the agenda. Why Python for networkers? How to start? So real life story, Simon Bates style about how I got started. Some advice on getting started. This is about teaching you why you should start and how to start to learn. So it's very much aimed at networkers with little or no coding experience. So if you're one of those people that is watching this and you know all about Go and uh, you've been configuring network automation, Python, etc. for years, this really isn't for you. This is for people. And I think there's a lot out there that are facing this new world of network automation APIs on networking devices, but they primarily are focused their skill set and their careers around CLI and SNMP. So this is really to encourage people to start to pick up coding and specifically pick up Python. So what is Python? Well, it's a high level programming language which favors ease of use over speed. So it's not the most efficient language out there. It's pretty, I saw some uh, tweets recently, some blog articles about how slow it is, but it is actually pretty easy to use once you get the grips to grips with it. It is open source. So, and that's, you know, important because of the uh, install can go on to, you get it with Linux, it's on Mac OS, um, and it's very easy to install on Windows, actually, as long as you tick the add to path box. And it runs everywhere, like I say, even on Windows. Now, you might think these last two points are a bit kind of, uh, lightweight, the fact that it's popular and that there's an active community, but that is really, really key about why Python is a great language to pick up and why it is popular for network tasks. So if we look in general, so this is the importance of being earnest index, which is just some kind of criteria, there's a criteria for um, judging the popularity of programming languages. I'm sure there's arguments for and against for the criteria that they use, but as you can see, Python is a popular language. So you've got Java at the top there. This is the one from back in February when I first did this. Um, Python's in at number four and has risen in the last year. Now that point about community, what it means is that there's actually lots of tutorials, books, videos, and blogs. So lots of free resource out there. Um, and if you go on any kind of online searches, so this is a, a really important point, I think, is that when you're starting out with Python, as long as you can articulate the problem, like you can get the error message and you can explain in you know, simple keywords like what you're trying to do, if you put that into your favorite um, search engine, you will end up probably being directly to the um, website Stack Overflow where you will, because of the community, because of the popularity, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands of people that have say, made that um, mistake that you've made, and there will be an answer for you. So that can really help when you're starting out. Uh, extra point there, there's a wealth of third-party libraries. So the, one of the things about coding is that hardly anybody actually writes their own code. Normally, you're just taking examples from other people and um, using them for your own purposes. That's basically what open source is all about. Um, so there's a wealth of libraries that have been written, and specifically, the request library is great for um, hiding a lot of the complexity for the API REST calls that we do if we're using automation against a REST API. So um, you will, one of the first steps when I'm ever setting up 
um, an environment is to import the request library and that really helps. So why Python for networkers? Okay, so if you think about IT in general, um, this is a point that's been um, discussed quite a lot. It's all about change and convergence. So if you think around virtualization and the big steps, I, about, what was it, about 10 years ago, I was working for a startup and that we had specific um, guys that would do the um, install of the new servers. And what they used to have to do is physically, if you wanted a new web server, they used to, because they weren't using virtualization, they would physically rack up a new server, plug in the RJ45, you know, stick the DVD in the drive, etc. If you now think think about what we've got in now for virtualization where you can just fire up a VM in a matter of minutes and then get working on the thing or you've got public cloud like AWS or Azure so you can just spec up your new server and get that rocking within again like a matter of minutes. So you've seen that in software and uh, server management they've already experienced great change and lots of automation so networking is behind in this respect. Lots of people still using the CLI, still using SNMP, you know, spanning trees still being used out there by quite a lot of, in quite a lot of networks. And it is changing, but slowly. So we want to speed up that change. And the command line interface has been identified as a primary inhibitor to change. So the CLI, I've recorded videos on this before. CLI is the human interface into a networking device. Humans are slow. We make typos. We make mistakes. What do ma mistakes make in this game on an operational network? They don't mean prizes. They mean outages. They mean service credits. They mean costs. They mean loss of reputation. So there's a renewed interest in network automation, just like other areas have been automated, like server infrastructure using tools like Ansible, for example. And a new point we've We've started to get APIs on network kit as an alternative interface. So my employer, Aruba, they released uh, a few years ago REST APIs on their uh, access switches on the Aruba OS switch since uh, 1602 was the version of code. So now we're on API version 4. Every new version of code that comes out, there's been except for the last one actually, there's been a new API in there. And we also have Aruba OS CX, which um, hopefully you are aware of, which is the brand new operating system, which has nearly full coverage and it pretty much everything you can do on the box, except for like real low level kind of infrastructure versus boot stuff, you can run via the API. That's not to say that you have to have an API to do automation, but it does help. Okay, so let's define some terms. So the new legacy is the static and manual configuration, which primarily uses the CLI. And we understand that this is the uh, large majority of campus customers are using these practices. So recently I've been touring around Europe and I went out to Dubai and I was running a workshop with my colleague Dick and we would talk to, it was internal and partners that would come in and we would ask them about automation and I would say that the vast majority of people and and when I say and this is reflected when I speak to customers the vast majority today are still using the CLI now the new hotness uh, the new buzz is around automation so by automation we mean combining multiple processes into workflow so if you think about the CLI you put in the command you check the output you put in another command you check the output Rather than man, so that's the manual interaction there because you're manually having to input and then you do the check, like the you're checking the response. What we do with automation is we write code so that we can run these processes and the code will actually deal with the responses and then take these tasks through multiple phases without having the manual intervention. So you start the task off, it will run through and you don't have to keep checking and then inputting the next CLI command. So this is what we call a programmatic approach. As I mentioned, this requires code. On the left hand, we have uh, left hand side, we have networking, which is stuck in its ways, but trying to change. We want to push things forward. We want to start to program and automate, but we're inexperienced, but we're hopefully willing to learn new skills. And then over on the right hand side, we've got Python, which is pretty easy to use, but powerful. What you can do very much uh, language of the moment with a thriving community and some great third party libraries like requests that can get us going pretty quickly. 
Okay, but this is pretty controversial to say stuff like this. So these are some of the responses that we normally get when I start talking about this because this isn't just something new. I'm not just sat in my bedroom recording this video. I have been out and spoken to a lot of people now. We're talking in the hundreds now about this. So some of the responses that I've had personally is people will respond say when we talk about Python, they'll say things like, but I'm not a programmer. In my company, we have dedicated developers that would write the code. Why should I? You know, my the guys and girls in the coding department they are not looking at networking so much, so why do I have to learn their skills? Also, you know, CLI and SMMP are critical to the job of the network. Completely understand that. So Python is seeing, you know, people kind of respond with the idea of like, well, why would I learn these new skills that I'm not really going to need in my networking job? So those are all valid responses, of course. But I'm going to be really bold here, and I'm going to say... Network automation is inevitable. And why I say that is because taking manual processes and automating them from the washing machine in your home to the car that you drive, that is taking a manual process and automating it. That is human progress through the ages. A good example, I think, would be uh, the, the Industrial Revolution. That, For example, here is a spinning jenny that was invented in 1764, and it essentially takes the manual process of weaving and automates the process so that the amount of weaving that can be done by one person is hugely increased. So this is automation of manual processes. And if you want something a bit more up to date, here we have Waymo. So Waymo, as it says here, it is Google's self-driving car project, okay? One of the things about this is that you might not realize this, this is actually live. There's an early riders program, public trial of Waymo's self-driving vehicles. This is bang up to date automation, you know, automating the process of driving. So automation touches every area of society and has done for hundreds of years from the shirt that you're wearing on the, your back when you go to the supermarket and you go through the self-checkout at the tills, automating processes. And even now in recent times, we have the automation of that extremely crucial and manual process of driving an automobile. Personally, and this is my personal opinion, I don't think networking can keep holding out as a manual process forever. So at one point, that's got to change. And it's not just my view. So Gartner's view, um, this is a quote from a blog that came out earlier in the year. So originally, this was a blog that came out in 2016 that made this claim, and it was called The Death of the CLI, which uh, caused a bit of excitement, you know, um, because obviously so many people rely on the CLI. So it was a very bold claim to say that the CLI was actually going to die. But what they said, is, this is a quote from the follow-up blog, actually, that's quoting the original blog, I should mention. Um, By 2020, only 30% of network operations teams will use the CLI as their primary interface, down from 85% in 2016 so that's a huge drop and the reason that they gave was that there would be new products and new ways to manage the network that means that people would come off of the CLI because the CLI like I said inefficient typos it's not great to be running um, such mission critical networks using the CLI for day-to-day -day processes they followed up on their uh, blog and these are the stats. I mean, they only st surveyed uh, 64 people, but we can see from the 85% of their previous survey, it was still the CLI was being used on the individual devices. 71% of the respondents said it was. Um, so that's, you know, it looks like the prediction is off. Um, you can see there that uh, that's CLI, you've got other automation tools there. And API is being used by only 3% of the people uh, queried, but... This is a specific quote. Um, however, the real kicker is that we, when we ask folks where they plan to make the most strategic networking investments in 2018, you know, where they're going to spend their money, network automation won by a landslide by 49%. So, and I'm seeing this personally in my job. We're getting a lot of people interested in network automation. I've had meetings specifically where people are saying, okay, what is your network automation? What's your approach to network automation? There's a huge amount of interest in that in the industry right now. And boom, Python is your gateway into this. If you're trying to not automate a network and you don't know any code, well, I don't know how you would do that with
without any kind of coding skills. As I've explained, you need a programmatic approach to automation. Code allows you to drive the task and handle the responses so that you can move through these different phases of taking those manual tasks and, and automating them. So Python is a great way of running automation. It's a popular way to do that. But, you know, the network engineer needs to be able to pick up these skills. OK, so how would we start to learn Python? That, that, that's a lot about, you know, why and how that fits in with automation. But if you're as a network engineer that you sat back, you've got this far into the video, you think, OK, where do I start? Well, don't believe this stuff. This is a word of uh, caution when you're starting out. If you see anything like this, learn Python and you definitely will learn Python in seven days. OK, so there's a book there, learn Python in seven days. That seems a very quick time to learn a new programming language unless you already know a lot of coding. You're doing that. What about learn Python in one day? Of course, we have one learn Python in one day and learn it. Well, can we do can we go any lower than that? Learn Python in, of course, we can, you know, spoiler, of course, we can. There we are. Learn Python in 10 minutes. Absolutely amazing. So that's a, a word of caution from me about you really shouldn't um, believe the titles to these books. What you should believe is this. And it's an essay that's online. Teach yourself programming in 10 years. You know, why is everybody in such a rush? And the great thing about this is that it addresses this trend to have coding books that say, oh, learn this language. So the example there, you'll see how to teach yourself Java in 24 hours. And so you've got lots of variation. You know, this is this is nothing new in the coding educational space. And the, the essay itself t tells you essentially it takes a long time to, to really get to grips with a coding language. Specific, what we're specifically saying there is 10 years. So you might say to yourself 10 years, but the point is that I'd say is don't worry about that because you don't need to be a real programmer to actually get some benefit from coding network automation tasks. Yeah, there's a lot of the language that you wouldn't really need to go into because the steps that you're doing in network automation, a lot of that if you're using an API, if you're pasting and scraping CLI commands, it tends to be the same type of tasks that you're driving over and over again rather rather than going deep, deep, deep into the language. Because your primary focus always remains the networking tasks that you want to run and drive via the coding. So coding becomes, like learning Python, just becomes an additional tool in your toolbox, along with all of that knowledge that you've got about, you know, VLANs and, and, and Wi-Fi and all these networking skills that you've learned over the years, coding just becomes, it doesn't become the primary focus, it just is used in addition, and in addition to those skills like your CLI skills and your SNMP skills. And the other thing is that this essay should reassure you, because uh, it happened to me personally that I had a book uh, it's a great book actually by Matt Harrison which is treading on python I think it's called in that one it does say learn python in seven days and after about seven weeks I was thinking well, could I possibly learn all of this stuff in seven days from scratch you know and the point is that you can't learn python if you've got no skills you can't learn it in such a short space of time it's highly you might be able to go through the book once in seven days you know one of these uh, textbooks but that's not all of that knowledge is going to sink in. And the, the point is that coding really makes you feel stupid. So you see some tweets and articles online from senior developers that will talk about how when they're performing some coding tasks, they can feel like the king of the world or queen of the world uh, one minute. But then they feel like they have a huge come down when it's something that they think should work doesn't work. You know, that's part of the trials It's part of the the. Uh, <laughs> The thing that drives you a bit crazy about coding, but is sort of part of the, um, you know, the feeling of achievement when you aren't actually get something working. The key point for all my rambling is don't give up when you're beginning to learn. Don't look at those titles about seven days, 10 minutes, etc., etc. Just keep moving forward. Okay, so here, so on to, this is story time, on to my story. So my background is that I've got no coding background at all as of about two years ago, no formal IT or computer science education. So I studied history at university and computing is not a hobby. Other than playing a bit of Call of Duty, um, computing is not a hot. I had a ZX Spectrum, though, to be honest, you know, uh, horoscope skiing, etc. But I didn't have any interest, so I wasn't working on computing outside of work. I was 
was working for a bank. My first networking job I got through a buddy of mine. That was in 2001. And in six years, I passed the CCIE. Essentially, and the key point is with this is all I did is I learned Cisco networking through the Cisco books. So there was, you know, there's no wider knowledge there. Well, there wasn't at the time if you went CCNA, CCMP, CCIE. It was very specifically that you were looking at networking, not other areas of IT. You know, I didn't really understand DNS or anything to do with virtualization or anything when I became a CCIE because I just was very, very much focused on that doc CD um, syllabus, like getting through that exam. But OK, so what that meant was around 2012, when all the software defined networking conversations started up and I had to do some cu uh, customer presentations about that. But there's a lot of talk about, you know, these so it was other areas of IT that were kind of bleeding into networking where you had lots of talk about programmability. It's the first time I really heard about APIs. And I really did, I was a bit lost with this stuff because the work that I was, uh, my day-to-day -day job, I was getting deeper and deeper into MPLS and BGP designs. So I was doing, 2012, I was doing some pretty advanced stuff with like inter AS, what was it, multicast VPN. So this is my old slide. This is the way that I was feeling about some of the conversations that I was hearing because the point was that I just, couldn't get a handle on a lot of these things i mean the the um analogy i use is that like if someone said to me you know where does github fit in or where does um what is vagrant you know i couldn't even point to it on the map i wouldn't be able to tell you at what area of it all of these um funky sounding names how this all fit together and that you know that's a reflection of the, my, my own networking background so i thought i would do something about that I heard about Python a lot, so I decided to try to learn it. I used Code Academy. So this is, uh, I think this is one of the things that, um, you know, to encourage people if they do find it difficult. When you see these tutorials, it, if anyone talks about Code Academy, a lot of the time they're just saying, oh, how amazing it is. You know, they, it was really easy to get going and start learning and do all this coding. I hated it, absolutely hated Code Academy. I didn't like the format at all. I know that they've improved it a bit, but I would not start there personally. I did not like their the approach. And one of the big problems is that um, it does step you through some of the basics, but going back a few years, um, if you got stuck and then you went to look for the answer, invariably there would be answers on there from people that were much more advanced in the language than than i was at that time so they would give various answers that were like way 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 in the future of my learning and so to as soon as you see the answer and you just try to copy and paste it the whole thing is completely opaque you just jump straight to the it's like you just jump straight to the finish line and you haven't really learned anything because you've not followed a structured process that would be my criticism of Code Academy back at that time. But the, the main point about this is that when you see all these tweets and people going on about like how easy it is to learn, that everybody has their own approach. So you have your own trials and tribulations about learning to code. And don't feel stupid. Don't give up if you're trying to use one of these on, online tutorials or a book, etc., etc., and you're finding it difficult. I found it incredibly difficult and it really put me off kind of progressing further because I thought there's something wrong with me. I can literally cannot, I'm not learning via this way that everyone's tweeting that it's so easy. Looking at what I was actually doing, so this was all in my spare time. So day, day job, I was doing large scale proof of, proof of concept. Like I say, I was getting deeper and deeper into networking and there was no coding involved in any of this stuff. So even more BGP, even more MPLS, I was having some great successes with the, the proof of concepts and doing some V6 for the first time, no coding at all. So the, the Python was very difficult and I wasn't getting anywhere. The networking was really ramping up at this point. Moving on then. So what I decided because of what was happening, I was having success in my job, but I thought, well, there's, uh, there's only so far that I can take networking. I really need to. And I, I was conscious about my lack of understanding of other areas because I had stuck so closely to um, just Cisco's learning path. 2016 was the year like it was around Christmas uh, 2015 I decided right this year I'm just going to learn Python that's the thing I'm going to do by the I'm not going to learn like some new net area of networking I'm going to learn Python so I used a lot of books and tutorials uh, really kind of went at it 
and then um, so I can date this October 2016 on this channel I recorded my first Python video looking back at that I hadn't a clue what I was doing you know it's, it's, a, it's a video for uh, NetMiko which is using CLI commands to log into a device and do some automation I said I mean at the time I, when I recorded that video I knew nothing about functions I knew nothing about classes closures none of that more advanced intermediate stuff day job still networks no Python at all Okay, so 2017, this is when I, I feel personally that I finally got it. So that rather than having to um, look up every time I would write out anything in Python, I was able to actually sit down and write some, write a function, for example, without looking up too much um, of the detail. And what I was doing, the, the way that I really progressed was that I was starting each day, forget email, forget Twitter, blah, 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 all of that stuff. I was sitting down at my desk and I was doing 30 minutes or, or every workday and so most work days and even at the weekends were just trying to hammer that 30 minutes out. And at this stage, I was moving up to the more intermediate uh, Python books, I would say, to kind of gauge where I was at. And this is a really key point. So uh, the like I mentioned earlier about how there's REST APIs on the Aruba OS switch and the new OS, Aruba OS CX. So these have got APIs on them, and that meant that I could write code that was actually hitting these APIs and I was doing automation tasks and I was doing demos against those APIs. So the real key point about this, the day job and the study had finally collided. So looking back, false starts, so I had a lot of false starts and why I've gone into this detail is because I think that's where a lot of people, they'll feel this pain of trying to learn these new things, see that everyone else is saying, oh, it's so easy to learn Python, you know, really I shouldn't have used that phrase myself. Um, what I mean is, but that it's kind of, the Python is relatively easy to read once you've got the basics, but it is hard to get those basics. So I had a lot of false starts myself, essentially. And the biggest challenge was that the Python study didn't relate to what I was doing. So that's the past. The thing is now, because automation is becoming more front and center, and you see it across the board with all the vendors, they're all talking about network automation. There's APIs on networking kit. That is a big change. So that if you are a networker you can look at using code to interact with the devices now a lot easier and you can say okay you, you don't need an api with that but what you've got if you if you're using say for example netmiko you know a few years back you didn't have netmiko to be able to do these things now it's relatively easy to pick up the netmiko library or to run some api calls against networking kit and that's a big change i feel so the, in the past, the Python study, and you'll get this if you pick up some of these books and you're interested in automating a network or running some automation tasks, what you'll find with your Python study is that a lot of the time you're going through things like shopping lists, apples, oranges, pears, blah, 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 you know, and you have to remove the apples from the list. Or you're doing things like RP uh, role-playing games. They're telling you to constantly <laughs> write these, these games. And personally, nowadays, other than Skyrim, I really dislike uh, computer games. And it's a huge turn-off for me to be able to uh, have to put these things together because there was no networking in any of this stuff. But, you know, what changed? Committed regular study, that was a, that's a really big thing. And playing with the APIs on the Aruba switches, you know. And as I mentioned, across the board with vendor switches, you've got now a way to play code with your networking. But uh, what I would say, though, to talk about some other areas, uh, everybody learns differently. One of the things that I would encourage people, though, is, you know, like the Nike phrase, just do it. If you want to learn Python, just get on with it. Just get a recommended reading list. Get on and attempt to do this. It is difficult, but rather than sit and debate whether this, you know, network automation is going to happen, whether networking, because so many bloggers and there's so many articles out there. I mean, I've written one myself about, and that's essentially what this is all about, you know, whether network engineers should learn coding. And it's like, God, if you think about it too much, you'll never start. You're essentially, the more articles you're reading about whether you should start, you're wasting your time that you should be spending learning to code if you're a network engineer so there's a few quotes that i've got uh, got here ip engineer really respect uh, the chap uh, david g i think uh, that writes the ip engineer but some of the points that he makes i just feel like uh, if you were a network engineer that isn't hasn't started on your journey you might see something like that and think well oh, uh, should i bother you know because what i'm seeing is like people need to make that first step so you, like I say, if you're reading these articles and it's saying things like, you know, what is your goal? 
goal, if you don't have a goal in mind other than learning Python, you may feel like, is this really worth it? It is worth it. Well, more in, more on that in a moment. Then Packet Pushes over here. So we've got Show 332, Don't Believe the Programming Hype. It's an interesting program, um, actually, to listen to. The thing is, I think pretty much everybody on that show can code. You know, that's, that's the point. So if you're a network engineer like me who can't code and you're listening to a whole bunch of people who can code, then it, it seems a bit, you know, they're kind of selling you, yeah, no, you don't need it. But um, no, really, you, you should start. And Ethereal Mind, I'm not bashing. For once, he's not bashing BGP. He's actually bashing um, Python it. I'm not bashing Python, but only a few people are ever going to make the effort to master it. I don't know. To me, that's a bit patronizing to uh, network engineers as though they're not going to put the effort in to uh, master it. And also, big point, this kind of culture about networking, the knowledge that you need to run networks, that is changing. You know, it's not just about whether you can be bothered to make the effort to learn this stuff anymore. There's people coming into the industry. I know people are coming into the industry. So in Germany, dual study people and the interns, you know, they're coming into this networking industry. They don't have much networking, but I'll tell you what, they do know Python and they know REST APIs because it's in other areas of IT, you know. So I personally, I think it's a bit of a generational divide between those people that know a bit of Python, they know REST APIs that are kind of like below 30 if you're in most of the people that i met that are in their early 20s they and they're in moving into networking they already know a bit about apis they're interested in this stuff you know they grew up in the world of you know smartphones and cloud they don't put things in boxes like the people that are like me like in their 40s that kind of think oh right so i'm into vlans and i know, and i know my cli it, you know guys the world is changing Obviously, this is entirely my point of view. So any what I found is like when I try to just openly encourage people. So writing this tweet in October, message to all colleagues in networking without coding skills. Don't waste any more thoughts. So this is my point here. If you sit around reading all the blogs and think, just get on with it, you know, really do just start on this journey because that's the only way that you're going to get comfortable with this stuff. And then what? So this tweet got some responses along these lines. Big difference between Python syntax and learning to code, assembly C, C++. You do hear stuff like this. I mean, my point was really about, you know, a networker, you really need to learn to pick up these new skills, like I've said, so that you can interact with networking devices programmatically. And then a chat response about assembly code, kind of missing the part. I can understand what the, the chat's meaning there. I don't think it's anything bad, but it is um, not really that encouraging to someone that's starting out if they start reading stuff about assembly code. So I would slightly disagree with that um, approach. In addition, you, if you don't determine high level goal up front, you might end up choosing the wrong tool. Why did I pick up Java again? I never learned anything that I thought was useless. Knowledge for knowledge's sake, I think is a good thing. And the stuff that you're gonna learn through picking up coding if you don't have it, is going to help you and it's going to help you in your wider life and in modern society i would say because apis are everywhere they're on your you know home automation kit if you don't have these skills you're, you're kind of out in the cold for this stuff as i've mentioned so some of those points about like that you need it that you need wider coding or you need a goal up front now personally i kind of disagree with that stuff this is a point that some people say the real way that you'll learn coding is if you've got a project that you want to fix, you know, but what if you're one of those people that doesn't have a project? Does that mean that you don't start to learn? Do you need a predetermined end goal? Do you need to assess other approaches to automation? Like say, if you mention Python on Twitter, someone always says, and, and to my previous tweet, someone did say, hey, you should just learn Ansible. No, to all of those things. Reason being, do you need a project to fix? No, because if you've got no coding skills, the benefits are basic are in the learning of Python, right? You don't need to have some big project that you're walk, working towards. Maybe you might say in your mind, okay, I want to do some automation tasks, right? So that would, that's enough. Uh, just, just start, because one of the things with this is that the idea that I needed a project, I was sat there and I was thinking, I don't know what, I don't know what, what, what am I supposed to do? I don't really understand my project. I just want to learn this stuff. I want to get through this book. 
that helped me to just think, right, I don't need a project. I don't need that pressure. Thanks very much. I'm not saying that that isn't a good thing. Having a project, you know, the fact that I could use my coding skills against APIs really, really did help. But in the early stages, don't sit there scratching your head thinking, I need some project. You don't need a project. Just start to learn. Do you need to have a predetermined end goal? No, learning Python to start with is the goal because the new possibilities in this new world will reveal themselves once you are learning. This is like the old unknown unknowns out there. When you start and you don't have any kind of coding skills other than you know maybe you wanna automate a few things, you're not gonna see those connections until you start getting into learning this coding, starting to learn some of the, I'm going back to that point, I'm talking about people that don't have coding skills, that don't really understand what an API is. So if you don't have any of that kind of knowledge around wider IT and you're just very, very focused on your networking, then learning Python is gonna teach you so much that you just literally do not know what's out there. Do you need to assess other approaches? This is interesting, but I think if it, if you start off with, with Python, you have to stick with it. Don't do uh, five minutes of Python, find that hard, and then think you can pick up Ansible and that's the way that you're gonna do your network automation. One of the reasons for that is that if you were to just focus on Ansible, you're gonna get a limited view of the world. You know, the thing is Ansible, if you look at a nice tidy uh, playbook, which is written in YAML and you see those host names, IP addresses and the task, that looks great. What's underneath? It's Python. So you can only go so far if you're playing around with just the YAML. And to be honest, I think if you jump in and you, it, it's a bit like training wheels. Um, on a bike, you know, it might help you to start with and you might be like, oh, look, I'm running these playbooks. Isn't that great? But if you don't understand what's going on underneath, when someone start, pipes up and has a conversation with you about, um, you know, Ansible modules, you're probably going to get a bit lost. And even a conversation about YAML, about like structured data and these kind of things, you're probably going to get a bit lost if you don't have that fundamental knowledge. So I would say go more fundamental with the Python, learn that stuff and then start looking at Ansible or do both at the same time, you know, but don't put your Python aside because you're going to start thinking that you, you're going to, you know, set the world alight with some Ansible knowledge. And why I say all of these things about learning Python in this video is because, plot twist, this video isn't really about learning Python in itself. Python is just the delivery system, not the active ingredient. The active ingredient is learning how to interact with distributed systems in a programmatic manner. Python isn't the end game. It's the way to help you step away from the CLI and the limited confines of command line driven networking to connect with a wider world of IT. Python CLI, these are just tools Whereas what's really needed is a cultural change in networking to embrace the new approaches that automation represents. What you'll learn from picking up coding will help equip you for the new automated converged world that's been eaten up by software. So what will Python teach you? You know, so what do you need to learn as a networker? So these are, these are, this is the important stuff. This is the active ingredient. So you'll learn things like the data types, like strings, integers, lists, and dictionaries. You'll learn things like statements of doing things with the data, so your if and the else and for loops like iterators, print to screen or you know write to an Excel spreadsheet or put it in a database. You'll learn about scraping data like JSON, JavaScript, object notation, XML, these kind of things, the data that comes back from the APIs. And you'll learn about how to, and this is an interesting point actually, and this may, well, you may like this, you may not. When you start delving a bit further into the um, into coding, you start learning about the structure of code and how to reuse it. And coming from like a just strictly net, networking background, I found this sort of stuff very interesting about like how you would write code, like clean code, functions, modules, and classes, the kind of debates around that. Really, really interesting stuff. And the good thing is that all of this information that I've just mentioned is actually in one book. It, uh, the O'Reilly book, Learning Python, covers a lot of the stuff that you would need to start running automation tasks in a network. The thing is, this book is 1,648 pages long. Um, you know, people say it's mainly white space, old joke, um, but, it, you know, that's a lot to go through. Now, the thing is that the books and the tutorials, they teach Python. They don't teach Python for networkers. So it is hard to struggle through examples that can seem irrelevant. You know, the old shopping list and things, RPGs that I mentioned. 
you're going to d- deal with things like string splitting, format. Co- if you went cover to cover through, say, learning Python, this is the kind of stuff that you'd be looking at. It can be very slow going. It can be very dry. And the, and the big point about this is that it's hard to retain the newly learned knowledge. You know, you might you may read that page, come back a week later and it's gone. So this is a kind of real counter argument to the, the learning Python in, you know, a day or seven days. If you go through the book that fast and then put it down, if you go back 14 days into this process, you've probably uh, forgotten a lot of what you learned in that very short space of time. It takes time to really embed that knowledge into your, you know, to really start to understand what's going on. So my approach, right, this is what I did. So I like to go jogging. I did ask a room recently of people in the Netherlands, you know, so it, it, all, all the guys there. I said, oh, uh, so who uh, who's into exercise? Who likes to go jogging? Not one person in the room of 30 put their hand up, which was uh, quite fun. But there we are. Um, so think about learning Python like exercise. Hopefully this kind of analogy will uh, land with you. Um, a bit like jogging, you know. The thing is about jogging and running, it is hard work. It isn't any fun, especially if you've not done it before. It isn't any fun. Just going for a short run is very difficult. But each run is the goal in itself. You know, you're not thinking so much. Well, some people are like, I want to run a marathon. But really, if you're going to go for a run, normally, um, especially if you find it hard, your goal is something like, I want to reach the next lamppost. You know, it's just, I want to get to the corner of the road. It's just those small things. Those are your short term goals. What's right in front of you. That's what you will focus on. Um, so the run itself is the goal, just getting to the end. And so little and often gets results. So if you were going to go, I think, it, you know, even if you don't run, you probably can understand that if you go for three 5K runs a week, it's much better than saving it all up for a Sunday and trying to run, you know, half a marathon um, just in one day in one go. I find it's the same with Python. I've, this is the kind of approach that kind of sprung to mind when I was thinking about how I, how I was progressing. So short but often study, periods of study, you know, 30 minutes, just keep hitting that 30 minutes and don't get bogged down with all this stuff about the end goals and career aspirations or learning about the stuff about the bloggers and da da da. Just get into those basics and keep at it. Much like the running, you know, trying to get to the, the next um, lamppost, you're trying to get to the end of that exercise. That is your goal for the day. For the day. Just struggle through this stuff because a lot of the time the, the study does give you a headache if you really don't know what you're doing and you're learning new concepts this stuff is hard but you have to work through these basics to read before it's all going to start to bed in properly so making progress through the exercise just getting to the end of the exercise that is your goal to start with and once you're cool with things like your strings integers lists, you know you've got all of this basic knowledge Now you've got an advantage because you can start to play. So with my employer, you can start to play around with Aruba switches, the CX. And that's a huge plus because you can start to apply that knowledge. Um, And you can pretty quickly start to combine the Python skills with your networking knowledge. So you can start exploring things like automation, programmatic approach. Um, And I think of learning to code is like the Rosetta Stone. So like I've said, it unlocks lots of other areas of IT, like learning about databases, APIs, web scraping, version control, all of these things that you're going to learn once you go through this process and you start putting aside the idea that you need to run um, just, you know, you're just going to be CLI and SNMP. Now, a side note, and this is a side point here. This is, I think, really important about when you're starting out and you're learning Python, you've got your different versions of these scripts that you're running and you see the possibilities start to open up before you, I think that you really quite early should try to start to learn, um, invest time in learning Git. So get once you've got through some of those basics of Python, you really want to have a look at how you can learn Git. Because, so Git is version control of your code and you have things like, you know, Microsoft recently bought GitHub, which is kind of essentially cloud storage for code, which is all foundation of that is using Git. So what it does is it allows you to really kind of get in control of the scripts that you're writing. Also things like it encourages you to share and collaborate with people. It is very, that why I say you should start quite early with this is because it is very, very difficult. And you'll find there's that cartoon that goes around. Someone recently sent it to me. Essentially, you know, it's this whole thing of that most people don't really understand what's going on with git and when they get in a mess they just uh, clone down the repo again it is a very powerful tool and i found personally that it was really great to invest that time to learn it 
Okay, so if you let's talk about to finish up, we'll talk about some real specifics then. It, some of these questions that you might have if you were going to say, okay, I'm going to start out. Shall I? Then I mean, this is not really a relevant question anymore, unless I think you're looking at legacy code, cut some an existing code base that might be written in Python 2. If you're going to do some exercises, Python 2, you know, is coming to uh, end of life in a relatively near future, next few years, I think. So we don't want to be loading, unless uh, the only reason why you do that is if you're looking at Ansible, I think, as well. Ansible's written in 2.7. So what you want to be looking at, and recently released, was Python 3.7. So get that installed onto your system. Um, what you want to do, so, so to start out with, first steps is that you want to build a, d a development environment. So pick an OS, whatever you're going to do. So Windows, pretty easy install for uh, Python, as I said at the top of the video. Mac OS has got Python already installed, but you probably want to look into how to build something a bit newer because Mac does tend to use very old versions of Python. I think it's still on 2. I'm not sure if Python, not sure, but essentially you need to invest a bit of time in how to get the Python environment set up. Um, I've done some videos on that. Or you could pick up a Linux distribution and get Python installed there. Then you want to pick an integrated developer environment. So these are like your editors. You'll hear old hats and they'll talk about how they use Vim all the time or Emacs. That's really difficult. If you, <laughs> There's the joke about how you can't get out of Vim um, because it is pretty uh, tough to actually just do simple stuff like save and exit the editor if you're starting out. Um, so you want some kind of IDE, which is it essentially does things like spell checking your code. You know, it, it checks this code syntax called linting. It will do it. Some of these actually do spell checker. But, you know, if you it makes your life that much easier, because if you've got something like an unused variable, which will cause an error in Python, it tells you beforehand. It tells you before the code is running that you've got a problem. And so I found so uh, out of these, where am I? Visual code, very, very popular at the moment. A lot of clutter on screen, I found. You have to change a lot of the settings for it to actually get the kind of real estate that you're going to get from basically PyCharm. I prefer PyCharm right now. That's because I've got more experience with it. I think if I, if I was writing in various different languages, I'd probably go Visual Studio Code. Atom, I'm kind of I've pretty much given that enough time. I think I've invested enough time in that one, and I am going to move on. I think Visual Code... Uh, sorry, Visual Studio Code and PyCharm is pretty much all I'm interested in right now. Okay, so you need some tutorials. So there's lots of tutorials on YouTube about getting started. If you've got access to any of these resources, Safari, so you've got essentially pretty much every IT book that's ever been published, you can get hold of off of Safari. Or you get some fantastic videos. So Pluralsight is video-based. Um, there's some really great uh, Python tutorials on there and loads and loads of other stuff, you know, different areas of IT, different coding languages, all available on Safari, Pluralsight, and of course, you've got an active community, lots of um, YouTube videos. Now, what I would say though is don't worry, like when you're, uh, when you're going into this, don't worry about your networking to start with, just do those simple exercises like your hello world, get into those uh, data types and things. And learn one of the things so I'm going to do some videos on stuff like this like what I think networkers really need to focus on to be able to get into some automation things like how to call an item from a list or a value from a dictionary so you'll probably just sit because all of the Python tutorials just line everything up this will be alongside string formatting and Unicode etc etc but this is really vital about how to pick out items from um, so the indexing essentially of a list or how you can get a value when you call a key from a dictionary. That stuff, if you're using uh, structured data, so you've got JSON coming back, blah, 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 specific details, that's really important. You need to need to learn that. Get hold of some kit. So obviously a Ruby kit. Um, get the what, what you'll need to look at is the API schema. So you understand what you can use. You can use something like Postman. So Google's Postman, if you want to um, have something to hold your hand a little bit against an API schema. Um, or you can, or with CX, we have Swagger. What approach would I like? Play around with the auto authentication, the login, log out. Or everything that you're going to do, you're going to need to log in and you're going to log out. So get that down first. Get some code that gets you that. And then try to do some simple get calls. 
So if you're using an API, or if you're using some automation that is just CLI based, like NetMeco stuff, um, try and do some simple things. Just get some data off of the box, like get the VLAN table, get the MAC table, and try to pick things out, you know, from it. And then taking it a bit stir uh, further, don't do this on a live network um, unless you're <laughs> allowed to. Do some simple configuration changes, you know. Try to emulate what you're doing with the CLI. Do that with the API or via, you know, um, scripting. If you want some examples, this channel, of course, I've written some. I'm going to do lots more in the future now that I'm back uh, from doing the workshop. If you want some sample code, we do have some sample code up on the, this is public and we're going to have a lot more. There's some really exciting stuff coming soon. Sample code you can find up on github.com forward slash Aruba. There is the switching bot teams uh, stuff here. Uh, we're going to have plenty more where that comes up. If you want a reading list on my blog, I did put a recommended reading list of the books, the O'Reilly books that I've put and, you know, some YouTube channels that I've used. And so finally, some advice. That this Some of this comes from my colleague of mine, Rashani. Learn to code, learning a new language is scary, okay? It is difficult, it is hard. The main point, don't give up. Don't feel bad about asking for help, you know, when you're stuck. So you can use Stack Overflow, but like I say, there's a community. This is that point about community. There's lots of people out there that are in the same position of you that are starting to st take these steps. Don't be put off by those people that tell you that you should be learning assembly code. You know, that stuff's not helpful. Python is not your end goal. Your end goal is to learn about programmability. It's about learning automation. It's about moving off of the CLI. Okay, so that was getting started with Python. I hope you enjoyed that. Hopefully you got something from it, some advice, etc., etc. Um, if nothing else, hopefully you like the emojis. Um, so my name is Joe Neville. Thanks very much for watching and goodbye.